Oh, Crossing family, I love you. And I am so excited to have some time to be with you today. I've been looking forward to being able to talk to you and be with you for two weeks. I am so incredibly thankful for Nate Ross and the incredible message that he preached last week. I did my fast last Sunday, and I did my Sabbath yesterday, and I can't wait to see what God has in store for us on this 50 for 50 journey this upcoming week. Now, what if I told you that there's one thing that you could do that would drastically increase the length of your life and the quality of your life? What if there was one thing that would help you fight against worry, fight against anxiety, stress, and help you deal with depression? It gives you more energy, and it shifts your mood from being pessimistic to optimistic. It means that this one thing can make you a better husband, a better wife, a better parent, a better employee, a better boss. How many of you wish that you had more energy at the end of the day? How many of you wish you had more energy in the day, right? You're like, yeah, that's where I'm at. How many of us deep down inside know that our negative mood has been impacting the people we care the most about. You don't have to raise your hand on that one. I wanna welcome all of you joining from all of our different locations and I am so glad that you are here this weekend. We are so glad that we get the opportunity to partner with you in ministry. And to those of you who are here for the first time or the first time in a long time, I wanna welcome you as well. And I hope that you'll take advantage of the QR code on the seat right in front of you from wherever you are watching from. And to those of you who are part of our online family and those of you who are part of our inside family, we're so thankful that you're here today as well. This past Thursday, I actually had an opportunity to meet somebody who found Jesus through the crossing in the inside, and now they're a part of the crossing on the outside. And I absolutely love that we're that kind of church. Now, I just want to do a quick recap. We are in the middle of a series called 50 for 50, where we're spending 50 minutes a day for the 50 days leading up to Easter, asking God to move in us, change us, and use us like never before. And there are two main scriptures that are kind of guiding us on this journey. The first one's Mark chapter 12. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? What's the most important thing I can do? Well, Jesus answers. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your, everybody help me out, strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Then Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, we find these words. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. There is nothing greater that you and I could give our lives to do and accomplish. We are to love God, love people, and our mission is to help people find an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We desperately want this region where we live, where you guys are watching from, to be the hardest place on planet Earth to get to hell from. And in order to do that, we realized that we needed to make some decisions, some commitments. One of the phrases you've heard a couple times throughout this series, and you'll hear until we're out of this series, is a quote that Steve Weatherford made when he was with our church last year. He made this statement. Amateurs make decisions based on their emotions. Pros make decisions based on their commitments. Do you guys remember last Wednesday when uh, we woke up next to the North Pole? You guys remember that? And I've been doing my morning walks for the 50 for 50. And I took about two steps outside and realized that the clothes I was wearing were not ideal for the walk that I had ahead of me. And then I had this thought, if I go back inside, I could just go back to bed. I mean, missing one day out of, and I was like, nope, I made a commitment. And off me and the golden dummy went, 
uh, which is their dog. It's not a person in my family. It's just this dog. Anyhow, we realize as a church that it is time for us to go pro in the things that matter the most. Loving God, loving people, and making a difference in this world for Jesus. So, what is this one thing that will help you live longer and give you a better life? What's this one thing that will help shift your mood and help you handle the hardships of life? What's this one thing that will help you win the battle in your minds and settle down your emotions so they don't swing too far out of line? The answer might surprise you. The answer is physical fitness. Now, before I get any further into the sermon, I wanna go ahead and acknowledge some pinch points, okay? First part, uh, pinch point one. This sermon is not as much about waistline as it is about worship. This sermon is not designed to fat shame. And if at any point in time during this sermon, you feel like uh, this sermon was unkind or harsh, I need you to know that that is not and was not my intention. I am fully aware that for some of you, there are medical and physiological issues at play. To those of you who are skinny, we hate you. (laughs) Okay, now you know. And I want you to know this. You can be just as unhealthy. Your metabolism just hides it. We've all seen people who eat whatever they want, play video games, never go outside, never gain a pound. Again, hear me, for you, this sermon is not about waistline. This sermon is about worship. Some of you, you used to be a person that was pretty judgy at how other people looked. And then all of a sudden you turn 40 and nothing fits anymore and when you look in the mirror, your body resembles more and more the type of body that you used to shame in others. Pinch point number two. I know that on some levels, if not many levels, this will be a hard sermon to hear from me. I was recently talking to a person at one of our locations and uh, she said to me, I, know, I heard the camera adds 10 to 15 pounds, but exactly how many cameras do they have on you? <laughs> and uh, we'll miss her. As you guys know, about 25 to like 50% of my humor on a weekend has something to do with my body. I'm actually in somebody's phone as too fat for chopsticks because I think I made a comment about that at some point in time and my kids saw their phone and like, Dad, why are you in their phone as too fat for chopsticks? And then my kids went, oh, never mind. okay. And let, let, me, let me pause for just a second so you guys, so I can clear the air on something. I am intentionally funny on a weekend. And the reason I am intentionally funny when I am communicating to you is one of my professors did his doctoral thesis on comedy and information retention. And people who laugh learn more. Now, uh, so I don't want you to think that just because I'm funny, I'm not deadpan serious about the truth of God's word and the implications in your life. I'm funny because it helps you re-engage in a sermon that you've maybe drifted off on. I help create an environment that where you have positive and enjoyable memories because sometimes it's easier to handle a hard truth with a little bit of laughter. As Mary Poppins once said, just a spoonful of sugar helps the... There you go. Now, the other thing is, I can't write funny. So my sermons are just deadpan, and then I preach them and something funny happens which is why sometimes I say things <laughs> that I shouldn't have said, and I just want you to know in advance, I'm sorry, and I'm so glad that you're here at second service and not first service, which is why I needed to give that a little asterisk, okay? Now, one of the values here at our church that we champion on our staff is that in leadership, we are to be the example, not the exception. So when we ask people to park far away from the church building so that way there's room for people who are coming to our church for the first time closest to the building. Me and the people closest to me, we're parking as far as we possibly can from the building. If we're telling people, hey, on your way into church, pick up a little piece of trash, so that way the place looks better, you better believe me and my son are picking up a piece of trash. We believe that in leadership, you're the example, not the exception. Paul writes to the believers in Corinth, and he tells them to follow his example as he follows the example of Christ. 
that each and every single one of us should be a living, breathing example of what it means to be a Christian so that others can take notice and follow in our footsteps. So, when a person like me, shaped like me, preaches a sermon on a topic like this, it opens the door for me to be a gigantic hypocrite. And I felt like I should just acknowledge it. However, I am hoping that over time, you guys have learned to see my heart and my care for the Lord and the scriptures and for you. And I want you to hear me say this on the front end. This is a sermon that I need. I'm gonna preach it to me and you are more than welcome to listen in. Third thing, when I preach, this is just for the 48th Street people. When I preach, I make eye contact. And you can imagine making a eye contact in a sermon on this subject matter could make some people feel like, are you really just singling me out? Like the last thing I want is someone going, you were talking directly to me, like you just kept looking at me. I just look for smiling faces because I just need some positive feedback when I preach. So if you don't want me to look at you, just look like somebody you don't like is talking to you because I just don't want anybody to be like, why do you keep looking at me? I know I'm not at the size I'm supposed to be. That is not my intention. I can't help where my eyes go when I preach and I'd like to make eye, good eye contact. So that's why I keep looking at the camera. But eventually 48th Street, I'm gonna start looking out in your direction and I mean no hate by it. Deal? First Timothy chapter four, verse eight says this. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And for many of us, we read this scripture, and because we desire to be spiritual, we focus on the most important part of the passage. And so this is how we read it. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present and the life to come. And hear me, that is really, really good. That's the most important part of the verse. However, it doesn't mean that the other part of the verse doesn't have any value at all. Some of you, you're big workout people. You love physical fitness. You're like, oh my goodness, finally a sermon for us. I hope he talks about, yeah, no, this isn't gonna be that for you either. But you focus on the first part of the verse and you give yourself a gold star and I want you to know you do this to your peril. And they read the verse like this. For physical training is of some value. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. That is not God's desire for you. Remember in the sermon on idolatry, that idolatry can happen when you take a good thing and you put it in the wrong place. The problem has become that when we focus solely on the physical, we neglect the primary importance of the spiritual. But we should also remember when we read this passage that all scripture is God-breathed. And it is useful for teaching, correcting, and training in righteousness. So as Christians, when we read this verse, this is how we should read it. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. The most important part is indeed the spiritual component, but that does not mean that the first part of this verse has no value in the life of a believer who wants to do the things of God. I wanna remind you, Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, you guys know this verse, say this. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. Our bodies were made by God. They are a gift from God to you to accomplish his great commandment and his great commission. You cannot love your neighbor without a body. You cannot accomplish the great commission without a body. Furthermore, did you know, if you're a Christian, your body does not belong to you. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter six. Do you not know that your, everybody say this, bodies 
are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Matter to God. They're created by God. They're a gift from God. And they have been purchased and redeemed by God. And our job is to be a good steward of the gift of our body that God has given to us. If you're reading the 50 for 50s, you read this verse this week. Romans chapter 12 speaks to this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That's why I said this sermon has way more to do with worship than it does with your waistline. It's about doing our best to bring our best to God for him to use to accomplish the great commandment and the great commission. And you guys know this, we have an enemy in this work. Second Corinthians chapter four says this, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Those of us over 35 know that our bodies don't work the way that they used to, right? Gravity, time, take their toll. So as Christians, through Christ, our spirit, our soul, is being renewed day by day. But your body is on a constant collision course with destruction. And our body is connected to our soul and our spirit. That means the health of one impacts the health of the other. And when the health of our bodies is neglected, it impacts our usefulness, our energy levels, our moods, our memory, how we handle mental hardships. Our bodies are so important that God put one on in Jesus. Our bodies are so important that we are gonna receive a resurrected body upon the second coming of Christ. Your body, my body, matter. And how we steward them matters. We're warned in scripture not to be gluttons. Gluttons are people who consistently overeat. They have a hard time pushing away from the table, saying no to seconds or thirds, They end up choosing to eat their feelings or solving boredom with constant trips to the pantry or through the drive-thru. And over time, this causes a whole range of problems physically. One of the challenges many of us face today is that we live such extremely busy lives that we are eating mostly complex, processed foods. And these cause inflammation, digestive issues, and a lack of real nutrients that are killing us slowly. It's now a joke in the world today that you can spot an American when they travel abroad because our size is giving us away. I wrote uh, this sermon while I was on a cruise. And I, uh, somebody had purchased the opportunity for me to be able to go on this cruise and be able to connect with other pastors and learn from them to try and uh, do a better job for our church. And the first night on Sunday night, I was sitting next to this guy who's a pastor of a church in Ohio that's doing some really great stuff. And he turned to me during dinner and he goes, do you know that the average person on a cruise gains 1.5 pounds a day? And I got scared. Cause I was like, uh, we're here for six days, that's nine pounds. And so I immediately went back to my room and reorganized my clothes and moved the clothes that were the tightest to the front because I was pretty sure some of the clothes I had didn't have nine pounds of grace. Like there was, we, it was not gonna be pretty. It was like, we gotta get those on first. Yeah, it was, it was no bueno. Then on Wednesday, I didn't go on any of the excursions. I wanted to finish the sermon. And so I sat in the cafeteria and I wrote the remaining part of the sermon. And while I was writing the sermon, I saw people make repeated trips 
to the all-you-can-eat buffet with plate after plate after plate piled high. Some of them were barely able to move around, and my heart was hurting for them. And it served as a warning for me. I don't know if it was by God's grace or what happened, but uh, that day I got food poisoning and influenza A. Um, So I lost all of it. Um, I was so sick, I could have pooped in somebody else's pants. It was the worst. (laughs) It was not, I'm telling you, it's the worst it's ever been. And now you're going, I get it, comedy, I'm tuned back in now. Okay? It was bad. Uh, Yeah, so I got off, you know, I'm like, two or three bottles from Imodium AD from being Brad Pitt, folks. Uh, Just watch out. Okay, I'm just, all right, anyhow. Uh, And I want you to hear me. This sermon is not, is not, is not about legalism. It's about worship. It's about stewardship. It's about impact. I was in Savannah, Georgia, 10 years ago. And Don Wilson, who was the pastor of Christ Church of the Valley, was speaking. It was kind of his swan song. He was uh, disposing some last minute uh, wisdom before he stepped down as being the senior pastor. He had started this church in his living room in Phoenix, Arizona, and it had grown to one of the largest churches in the country. They had over 20,000 people, butts in seats on a weekend. And he was talking about things he wished he would have done differently. If he could do it all over again, what would he change and what would he do more of? And near the top of the list, This is what Don Wilson said. I would have prioritized my physical health because it impacted the way I pastored. It impacted the way I led people, the way I preached sermons, the energy that I brought to the staff, to my kids. One of his biggest regrets is that he didn't prioritize his physical fitness sooner. So, that means I owe you guys an apology. I have not loved you as well as I should have. I am a hard worker. Those closest to me, uh, that's the thing they compliment me on the most. However, if I really loved God, and I really loved you, and I really loved the people that you were trying to reach, and I really loved the staff, of the crossing, and I really loved my family, I would need to prayerfully consider how to be a better steward of my body, how to prioritize physical fitness in my life. On Super Bowl weekend, you, there was a video that, was, uh, that I played that was kind of setting up this 50 for 50 journey. And let me just pause for just a second, because I get a little bit of heat from this from you guys, so I just want to clear something up. Uh, every time I shoot a video, it's not my house. Okay? Some of you guys get all tripped up about that. The first time I did it, I had people come up to me and go, I really, your house was so beautiful, but why did you have a W behind you? And I said, because we're winners. Um, but actually, the truth is, <laughs> is that the people who own the house's last name starts with a W. And then I did the Super Bowl one, and I had people going, so tell me, man, that's a really not, not my house. No, not my house. My house we're trying to fix it up. It's got furniture with the uh, stuffing mist. You know, my dog's laying on it, on his back. It's a bad, you know. We don't use my house. So stop giving me a hard time about it. It's not mine. And if you have a great house, we'd love to film in it, all right? Uh, <laughs> we'll come right over, all right? We're literally not there more than a month. And um, anyhow, during that start into that video, I talked about a guy who I saw semi-regularly. And when we were having conversations with him, he was talking about the journey that he was going on in the area of his diet, what he took into his body, and his exercise, what he did with his body. And that over time, he had significantly transformed his body. And I saw him, we were at a pool, and he was holding his young daughter, and he took his shirt off, and he was in the pool with a six-pack. And I was like, oh. So I was texting with him, and I said, dude, you were the guy I was talking about. And I want you to see what he sent me. This is what it said. When you get a free moment, give me a ring, not urgent. I always appreciate that, by the way. So that way I'm like, okay, what happened? He goes, one thing I meant to tell you was a thought I had. Satan wants Christians and non-Christians 
to be as unhealthy as possible, but for different reasons. For Christians, he wants our lives as short as possible, so we spread the good news of Jesus to as few people as possible. For the non-believer, he wants their lives short to limit the possibility of them hearing about Jesus. That should motivate Christians to tackle this head on. Love ya. I replied back, I love this, I'm gonna use it. He replied back, no charge. So you guys don't have to give extra this weekend. He gave it to that, us that for free. And then he sent this final text message, which is gold. If God wants us to treat our bodies like a temple, how do you think Satan wants us to treat it? Years ago, I heard about Tom Brady's workout regimen. And for those of you who aren't into the football world, uh, Tom Brady is uh, an incredible quarterback, uh, won multiple Super Bowls, and he survived in the NFL at the highest level longer than anybody else. But he was able to do that because of some profound commitments that he made to physical fitness. Can I just kind of take you through what his commitments ended up looking like? This is from the TB12 website. 5.30 a.m., wake up. 6 a.m., 20 ounces of water. 6.30 a.m., supplements. 7 a.m., protein smoothies, seeds, and nuts. 7.30 a.m., pre-workout pliability session. 8 to 10 a.m., strength and conditioning workout. 10 a.m., post-workout pliability session. 10.30 a.m., protein shake. 10.45 a.m., prepare 64 ounces of electrolyte water. 10 or 11 a.m., film study. Uh, 12 p.m., l- uh, lunch. Fish and, I don't know what those are. Um, 2 p.m., snack. Okay, that's important. I'm, I'm, par- I'm on the TB12 right here. 2 p.m., snack. 3 p.m., practice. 5.15, post-practice recovery with protein shake. 5.30, post-practice pliability session. 6 p.m., dinner, organic meat, something, and bone broth. 8 p.m., recovery, pliability session. 8.30 p.m., recovery supplements. 9 p.m., bedtime, biometric sleepwear. 60 to 65 degrees, no digital distractions, 30 minutes before bed. You wanna know what he did in the off-season? I'll show you. 5.30 a.m., wake up, hit the gym. 8 a.m., breakfast with family. 10 a.m., beach time. We're like, yes, I like this. I'll do off-season, Brady. Uh, 11 a.m., scheduled nap. This sounds fantastic, okay? You guys are like, sign me up for the off-season, Brady, right? 12 p.m., lunch. 1 p.m., surf and workout. 4 p.m., massage and rehab. 6 p.m., dinner with family. 7 p.m., review film, strategy with coach, charity work. 7.30, time with family. 9 p.m., bedtime. Tom Brady will go down as one of the greatest of all times. And he built his body. And we, he bent his body into submission to accomplish it. And the sad part is, all for a game. How much more important is the husband loving his wife? The wife loving the husband. The parents being the very best that they can be, bringing the best version of themselves into their parenting. When they're interacting with their kids, they're energized and optimistic instead of dragging and cranky. When will be the last time that you get on the ground and play with a grandchild? When will be the last time you pick up a grandchild or have the energy to go outside and play with them? When it comes to saying yes to pointing people to Jesus, shining on behalf of Jesus, will you and I bring our very best? First Corinthians chapter 10 says this, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. This is about what goes in. Look in Colossians chapter three, it says this, and whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is about what we do with our body. There's a lot of talk happening now about your biometric clock versus your chronological clock or your your chronological age versus your uh, biological age. And what they're noticing is that there are people who are 30 chronologically and they have the body of a 42 year old. Or they're 60 and have the body of an 82 year old. That because of how some of us 
are stewarding our bodies, we are aging faster and faster. Because of modern medicine and all the advances that are happening, we're living longer and longer. But our bodies are aging faster and faster. So when it comes to you, what is the prayerful decision that you need to make about honoring God, being a steward of the gift of God, of your body? When we were getting ready to start this 50 for 50 journey, I was a little bit going, okay, so I'm going to, you know, the reading and the prayer, I'll be fine, but this workout thing. And I've done workouts. I've been serious about it, then not serious about it. You guys know how that drill goes, right? You get fired up, you don't. You do a diet, and then you quit. You, you know, you've been on the, you've, you know, all the highs, all the lows. And what happens for me is, is I'll do it for a while, and then I'll uh, get knocked off schedule. Or, uh, you know, sometimes for me, it's hard to work out in public places because I, people want a chance to talk to me, and I want a chance to talk to them. But then it turns into a whole lot of talking to people and not a whole lot of working out. And so you have to try and navigate that stuff. And what I typically do is I write myself a permission slip. And so during this 50 for 50, I was like, what's the thing that I can do that no matter what, nobody can stop me? And I was like, okay, I know what I can do. I can go for a walk uh, at least 20 minutes every single morning. And so I want you to know for this entire 50 for 50 journey, if you've been thinking that like I've been getting up and doing burpees for 20 straight minutes, that's not been me. I get up, I put some raggedy sweatpants on and a sweatshirt, and I grab the stupid golden dummy, and I go outside and I walk in my neighborhood, regardless of the weather, for at least 20 minutes, and I pray for you. And if you want me to pray for you specifically, just send me an email, and I will add you to my prayer list. And if you don't send me an email, just know that I pray for you in a big glob of people. That is not the end of my story, but that's where I'm at right now. I'm making a tangible step to try and do a better job of honoring God with my body. When it comes to the mission of Jesus Christ, the question I want you to wrestle with is are you bringing the very best version of yourself to worship him with? When it comes to loving and leading the family that God has blessed you with, are you bringing the very best version that you can? I am not, hear me, I am not saying that some of you need to go on some crazy diet, take a bunch of pills, get a bunch of shots, and start working out six hours a day. What I am saying is, we need to have a prayerful conversation with the Lord and go, is there an area that I need to repent of? Is there an area that I need to stop? Is there something that I need to start? Because the future generations are gonna need us, and God deserves the best version of us. Will you join me in that mission? We're moving to a time of decision. If you are new to our church, this is not a typical weekend. So I hope you'll come back next weekend. And you might be going, all right, fine, I'll go on this physical fitness journey, but that's actually not the most important decision that you need to make today. Because it doesn't matter how big your biceps are, it doesn't matter how strong your quads are, it doesn't matter how long you can plank and how good your core is. If you don't have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have the right things in the right place. And the most important decision that you could make today is to entrust your soul to Jesus. The Bible clearly states that it is destined for man to die once and then to face the judgment. And so when you die, you will find yourself in the judgment seat of Christ. And the determination about whether or not you get into heaven or get into hell will be based on one of two things. And the first option you have is to stand there on your own merit, on all the good that you've done. But you'll also stand there in light of all the bad things that you've done. And I gotta be honest with you. I have a pretty dark past. There's a lot of shadows and corners in my life. And for as much good as I've tried to do, I don't think I've done enough good to get through it. 
But the problem is, is that when it comes to Christ, this is not like a balancing scale. So if you have a, a 10 pound sin and you have 20 pounds of good works, that you end up on the right side. Because God is not looking for you being good, he's looking for perfection. And so when you messed up once, You tilted the scales in perpetuity. So you can stand there on your own. And I want you to know that that will not end well for you. But if you've been going on this 50 for 50 journey, church, you know what I'm about to talk about because you read Romans this week. And Romans 5 verse 8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Which means that before you could get anything right, before you could have the right beliefs, before you could have the right thoughts, before you could say you're sorry, before you could repent of what you've done, God moved on your behalf because he loved you. And he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. And then if you were reading in 2 Corinthians chapter five, you'd have realized that God made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What that means is, is when you're standing in front of the judgment seat of Christ, you can stand on your own and you'll go to hell. Or you can stand on the work of Jesus. Because what God did is he took Jesus who knew no sin and he took all of the sin in you, past, present, and future, and he laid it on Jesus. And he took all of the righteousness of Jesus and he laid it on you. And so when you stand before God at the judgment seat, he doesn't see your sin, he sees his son. That when you stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ, you are the righteousness of God because you have been <coughs> brought into a right relationship by grace through faith. And you saw 47 or 48 people start that journey this past week. And I want you to know that you can start your journey this week. And in just a few moments, you can walk right over there to the baptistry and there's somebody who would love a chance to talk with you about that or you can talk to somebody in your row. To the rest of you who you're Christians, uh, you've been around here long enough to know that we're about ready to ask people to pray and some of you are gonna wanna come up to the steps and pray. And I've been worried about how to navigate this because how do you have people come to the steps after a sermon like this and then not kind of turn into like a Weight Watchers rally up at the front, right? And then you're sitting there and you didn't go forward and people in your row are looking at you like, I think you should. Do you hear me? Can you just navigate that with me? And so I just, I just there's tension there, okay? But every single one of us, regardless of our waistline, this is about worship. Are you honoring God with your body? And if you're going, you know what? There's probably some decisions that I need to make. There's probably some areas that I need to repent of. There's probably some things that I need to do a better job of. Would you come to the steps and pray? Uh, I'll try and make it easier for you. You know, if you're already skinny, would you kind of like come to the front first? Can I make it even easier for you? I'm gonna go to the steps and I'm gonna pray and ask God to do a work on me to help me honor him more with my body. And if you'd like to join me, I'd love to have you. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, I'm just gonna pray the same prayer I've been praying before I preach. Because God, truthfully, it's all I want. God, I'm nothing. This sermon's nothing. This church is nothing. This service is nothing unless you're in it. So inhabit this place and do what only you can do in ways that only you can do it. And start a fire in this church that Satan can't put out. In your name I pray, amen.